All right. Well, Pastor Josh is on vacation. He's actually in Chicago right now. So keep him in your prayers. And I will be uh, continuing as I fill in tonight in 1 Samuel. So go ahead and turn in your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 26. 1 Samuel chapter 26. And we'll jump right in after we open up in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word, the encouragement, the correction, uh, the enlightenment that we receive from you. My prayer is that tonight you will speak to each of us whatever we need to hear. Help me to be clear, accurate, filled with your spirit as I teach your word and prepare our hearts to hear your word. May we leave here encouraged and ready to meet every challenge for your glory and uh, under your blessings. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So the plan is to cover two chapters tonight, 1 Samuel chapter 26 and 27. Uh, we have David uh, still on the run from Saul, and what we have is very similar to what we had last week. It's almost going to be like deja vu, because we have two chapters juxtaposed, connected to each other, to show two different sides of David, two different sides of his spiritual walk. Last week, as Pastor Josh covered, you saw David at the height of his spiritual faith, trust, courage, where he refused to kill Saul in the cave right there when he had an opportunity. But that same David didn't trust God to handle the situation with Nabal and almost killed him and his entire family. Those were two chapters, one good side of David, one where he messed up. Well, the same thing is going to happen tonight. First, we're going to look at chapter 26, and we're going to see some highlights of David's spiritual journey and some lessons for our own life. But then in chapter 27, David's just like the rest of us. He's on the downside of his spiritual journey. He's not quite living up to what he should be living up to. So we'll see some examples of what not to do in that chapter. So I think the easiest thing to do, I kind of debated this, but I think the easiest, clearest thing to do is for me to read the entire chapter, not cover every single verse and every single detail, but read the entire chapter and then come back and make some points about that. So let's go ahead and look at 1 Samuel it's a much longer chapter. 1 Samuel chapter 26, starting with verse 1. It says, Then the Ziphites came to Saul at Gibeah, saying, Is not David hiding himself on the hill of Hakalah, which is in the east of Jeshurun? So Saul arose and went down to the wilderness of Ziph with 3,000 chosen men of Israel to seek David in the wilderness of Ziph. And Saul encamped on the hill of Hakalah, which is beside the road on the east of Jeshimon. But David remained in the wilderness. And when he saw that Saul had come after him in the wilderness, David sent out spies and learned that Saul had indeed come. Then David rose and came to the place where Saul had encamped. And David saw the place where Saul lay with Abner, the son of Ner, near the commander of his army. And Saul was lying within the encampment while the army was encamped around him. And then David said to Ahimelech the Hittite and to Joab's brother Abishai, the son of Zariah, Who will go down with me into the camp of Saul? And Abishai said, I will go down with you. So David and Abishai went to the army by night, and there lay Saul sleeping within the encampment with his spear stuck in the ground at his head, and Abner and the army lay around him. Then Abishai said to David, God has given your enemy into your hand this day. Now please let me pin him to the earth with one stroke of the spear, and I will not strike him twice. But David said to Abishai, Do not destroy him, for who can put out his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? And David said, As the Lord lives, the Lord will strike him, or his day will come to die, or he will go down into battle and perish. The Lord forbid that I should put out my hand against the Lord's anointed, but take now the spear that is at his head and the jar of water and let us go. So David took the spear and the jar of water from Saul's head, and they went away. No, no man saw it or knew it, nor did any awake, for they were all asleep, because a deep sleep from the Lord had fallen upon them. Then David went over to the other side and stood far off on the top of the hill, with a great space between them. And David called to the army and to Abner the son of Ner, saying, Will you not answer, Abner? And then Abner answered, Who are you who calls to the king? And David said to Abner, Are you not a man? Who is like you in Israel? Why then have you not kept watch over the, your lord, the king? For one of the people came in to destroy the king, your lord. This thing that you have done is not good. 
as the Lord lives, you deserve to die because you have not kept watch over your Lord, the Lord's anointed. And now see where the king's spear is and the jar of water that was at his head. Now Saul recognized David's voice and said, is that your voice, my son David? And David said, it is my voice, my Lord, O king. And he said, why does my Lord pursue after his servant? For what have I done? What evil is on my hands? Now, therefore, let my Lord the king hear the words of his servant. If it is the Lord who has stirred you up against me, may he accept an offering. But if it, it, if it is men, may they be cursed before the Lord, for they have driven me out this day that I should have no share in the heritage of the Lord, saying, Go serve other gods. Now, therefore, let not my blood fall to the earth away from the presence of the Lord, for the king of Israel has come out to seek a single flea like one who hunts a partridge in the mountains. And then Saul said, I have sinned. Return, my son David, for I will no more do you harm, because my life was precious in your eyes this day. Behold, I have acted foolishly and have made a great mistake. And David answered and said, Here is the spear, O king. Let one of the young men come over and take it. The Lord rewards each man for his righteousness and faithfulness. For the Lord gave you into my hand today, and I would not put out my hand against the Lord's anointed. Behold, as your life was precious this day in my sight, so may the Lord be precious so may my life be precious in the sight of the Lord, and may he deliver me out of all tribulation. And then Saul said to David, Blessed be you, my son. You will do many things, and you will succeed in them. So David went his way, and Saul returned to his place. Okay. What I wanted to do is kind of share with you from this chapter some, some positives, some things that you and I should aim for if they're not already in our life. And if we happen to be at a point in our spiritual journey where we see these characteristics in our life, then that's something that should be encouraging to us. It should say, hey, we're going in the right direction. We're doing the right thing. So it's either something to aim for if it's not there or something to be encouraged by if it is there. And I'm going to share with you what I've called five signs. Five signs that your spiritual journey is going in the right direction. Here's the first sign. Your spiritual journey is going in the right direction when, you tr when, you, when your trust in God enables you to act boldly despite the risk you know and we've seen this throughout the bible we see it throughout the book of samuel that that whenever a person's going in the right direction when their spiritual walk is in a place of, of progress that one of the things we see in that person's life is a bold type of faith we saw it in jonathan remember when jonathan with his armor bearer went to face against a, a whole camp of the philistines we saw it earlier in david when he went out to face Goliath without any armor on. Well, we also see it here. Because it was told in verse 6 that David said, let us go into the camp of Saul. There's 3,000 men with Saul. Chosen men. This is not, from a common sense human point of view, this is not a wise move. Can we agree on that? This is something that takes an audacity, and some would call it foolishness, but it's not foolishness. David is trusting that God will protect him. That even though he's going in the midst of thousands, that God will watch over him. His faith is at a high point, at its zenith, at this point in his life. Later, one of the psalmists wrote, and I don't know if it was David or someone else, but he wrote this, and it's up on the screen there already. It says, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. And he just said, that's the kind of, this, that mindset right there, if I'm in the shelter of the Almighty, I'm under his wings, that's what David displays here. Now, I wanted to give you an illustration to help you imagine how crazy this story must have seemed to the original hearers. For David to go down into this camp of 3,000 people who are all seeking to destroy him. I mean, if you happen to be behind, let's say you're, leaving church tonight and you you happen to get behind a group about 50 hell's angels and they're going a little slow for your liking would you blow your horn now some of you are saying yeah i would <laughs> but the truth is most of us like ain't no way i'm doing that because that I, I that's an unwinnable situation and yet david goes down into the camp with boldness this is not presumptuousness this is not foolish self-confidence. David is trusting the Lord to take care of him the same way he did when he faced Goliath, the same way he did in other situations in his life. Now, bringing that home to where we live, 
we don't have to go into any camp with 3,000 people seeking to destroy us. But I can tell you, you can look at your life, and I can look at my life and see if I'm going in the right direction spiritually by looking and saying, am I stepping out boldly to take risk for God? Does my tr- is my faith in God so sufficient that I can act boldly despite whatever risk there may be? In our way, it might, it might look something like this. For instance, sharing the gospel. Doesn't that take some boldness? Aren't there some risk involved in that? Risk of ridicule, risk of displeasing people, risk of being rejected. But there's a boldness involved in that. Uh, uh, giving faithfully. Now, the, giving faithfully always takes a certain amount of selflessness. But when you give when you're not sure that you can pay the bills, that's when it's bold, isn't it? That's when you're displaying trust in God. Um, being honest. I, well, I'm giving a better example. One of the examples that, that we have observed here as a part of our church and other churches, the Fox family, originally from Colorado, had a very successful business, very successful career. They, career, they joined us down here, and they had been led out of that to go down to Belém, Brazil, a place of one of the highest crime rates in the world. They've already been robbed several times. They were just joking on Facebook the other day that they're getting a little soft. They haven't been robbed in two months. You know, but they think about, does that show you something about where their faith is, to take them and their family to leave all the security of a good, cushy job in a nice uh, suburban home? But that shows you something. And all I'm saying is that same in our life, do we see that same kind of boldness, that same kind of risk-taking, because it's a good, positive sign that our spiritual life is going in the right direction. That's sign number one. Sign number two. Your spiritual journey is going in the right direction when you're consistently obeying God despite multiple ongoing temptations or pressures to disobey. I want to point out something here. I'm going to give you an example from David's life, but I think the most important word, and I may have even, I did underline it on your, out, on your PowerPoint there, is consistent obedience. You see, what I, a lot of times we get very proud and we remember and say, oh yeah, I obeyed God about that. Well, we all obey God about some things, some of the time, in some circumstances. There's really nothing significant about obeying God some, about some things, some of the time, in some circumstances. In the same way that some people stop at some times and obey the speed limit sometimes. You know, and nobody got any credit for that. You know, you, you could, if you got pulled over, you couldn't say, hey, I stop at, a, at, at nine out of every ten stop signs. There's, you know, it's like you need a consistency. Well, what we see in David is that he had a consistency, even under great pressure, to do the right thing, to do the biblical thing. You may have noticed, I'm sure you noticed, that this story has some deja vu familiar elements to it. Because only two chapters ago, David had the same opportunity. Here's, you know, and it was, it, here's David in a cave with Saul, no real risk involved to kill Saul, the man who's been pursuing him now for eight years, unfairly. But he refuses to do it based on moral, biblical, spiritual grounds. And it's good, it's good that he made that righteous decision at the cave of Adullam. But the question is, not will you make one right decision, but will you keep making the right decision. Here David has a second chance. And in many ways there's greater pressure now because Saul, despite his repentance, remember that, what he said last time, I'm so sorry David, you don't deserve this. Complete phoniness. Where's where's Saul at now? He's right back where he was before, still trying to kill David. It's now some time later. But despite the pressure increasing, here's what David says in verse 9. David said to Abishai, do not destroy him, for who can put out his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? Consistency. And that's what I would ask, just examine your life. Or even under pressure, when life is hard, when you're frustrated, when you're discouraged, when temptation just never leaves you alone, are you making that decision to obey God? Don't look at the one or two times either bad or good, because they don't tell us much. I, I've been golfing. Most of y'all have seen, something I shouldn't say most of you, but at least a couple in this room have seen me golf. Can one of them. Occasionally, I make it an amazing shot. 
but that doesn't make me a good golfer. And most of my shots are not very good. And occasionally, a good, I've actually seen professional golfers miss the ball on occasion. And bowlers, professional bowlers have a gutter ball. It doesn't happen a lot, but it happens. But nobody looks at that and says, that means anything. It's consistency. You're going to be tried in the same areas again and again and again. A lot of times we think, oh, I'm going to pass this test, it's over with. That's not what happened to David, is it? He had the test in the cave. Here he is a little bit of time later. He has that same test, whether he kills Saul, gets rid of his problem once and for all. So the question to ask yourself is, do you, do you obey God consistently? Do you speak the truth consistently? Do you reject gossip consistently? Do you resist temptations of sex, drugs, alcohol consistently? Do you maintain control of your temper consistently? That's what demonstrates you're going in the right direction spiritually. I'll give you one more example before I move on. Right now, I'm dieting. I wasn't dieting two hours ago when I had a couple of bacon sandwiches. And I won't be dieting, a, dieting an hour or now from my, when I have some ice cream. But all night, I'm going to diet. And then I'm going to break the diet in the morning at breakfast. Now, you, I'm being facetious here, but it's, real, it's kind of ridiculous, right? The fact that there's occasions where I'm not eating doesn't mean anything. What am I doing consistently and that's what I want us to do not to condemn us but to say where is my spiritual life what direction am I going in sign number three your spiritual journey is going in the right direction when you are ignoring people who are giving you unwise unbiblical advice one of the important barometers of where you are spiritually is that you know who to listen to and who not to listen to. Before I get to the point here in, this, in the example of David, as I was preparing this message, I remember something from many years ago, and I, had, I remembered enough details to look it up and confirm it was true and get some more details. And what I remembered, I got the details for, was that in 1993, and there was a NCAA, a collegiate level cross country race, they had 128 runners, and out of that 128 runners, 123 went in the wrong direction. True story, you can still look it up today. It was actually in the LA Times, I believe. And what had happened as they were coming to the place where they had, it's cross-country race, where they had to make this decision. One of the runners who went in the right direction actually stopped and saw that there was a little bit of confusion and told the people, this is the way you should go. And four people listened to him. But the rest of them said, but the crowd's going that way. And they decided to follow the crowd and ended up running 1,000 meters less than the five runners who followed the course. Now, I, this would be a perfect example, except as a sign of our times, the national NCAA decided, well, the majority went in the wrong direction, and they put the five people who did the whole course in last place. True story. But that's not the point I want to, I know, it's weird, isn't it? That's our, that's our culture. Majority rules even if they take the wrong direction. But my point is this, the majority was wrong. They didn't listen to the right people. And the same thing happens spiritually. A good sign of where you're at spiritually is that you reject the counsel of the wicked, you reject unbiblical advice, and you follow biblical advice. Well, in this case, David is down there with Abishai. Well, here's what Abishai's counsel in verse 8. Then Abishai said to David, God has given your enemy into your hand this day. Now please let me pin him to the earth with one stroke of the spear, and I will not strike him twice. Now in every earthly way, this sounds good. From the culture of the day, in the situation that David was in, it seems like this is the right thing to do. Abishai says, God, hey, David, this is twice now. God is putting right into your hands. This can't be coincidence. And then he gives him a little out. He says, you don't have to do it, David. Just let me do it. Your hands can stay free of bloodshed. And you don't have to worry about getting caught, David, because I'm going to pin him so hard the first time, there won't be a second time. There won't be any crying out. There won't be any alarm. We'll kill him. We're gone. Nobody knows the difference. But David knows enough 
to know that Abishai is not a man to listen to when it comes to trusting and following God. Now, I'm going to take a little liberty here and advance the story because you have to know who Abishai is to really appreciate what's going on here. Because Abishai doesn't really trust God and therefore he's not a man to listen to. Now I want to tell you, he has some good points. Abishai is a loyal and brave partner of David. In fact, later you'll see in one little sentence in 2 Samuel that, that when David's about to be killed, Abishai is the one who comes to his rescue. And that's when they say, David, you're off the battlefield. You're too old for this. But this same Abishai repeatedly doesn't trust God to fulfill his plan. He thinks he has to make it his own. This same Abishai later will partner with his brother Joab to kill a man that they think did them wrong, a man who did them wrong because he doesn't trust God to make things right. That name, actually, that man was Abner, Abner's brother. Or not Abner, but it was Abner they killed, but Abner's, it's a long story. I can't get into it. But then later, another guy named Shimei, who curses David, and he goes to David. This guy, Abishai, goes to David and says, let me kill him. And David says, no. And then later, when Shimei, Shimei asks forgiveness, Abishai says again, let me kill him. See, this, he has one good, not one say good quality, but one strong quality. He's good at killing. He wants to do it all the time. But he's not a man who trusts God. And therefore, he's not a man to listen to. And the thing is, you have the same people in your life. They maybe have some good characteristics like Abishai. They may be a friend of yours, a family member. They may be a fellow church member. But they're not people you should listen to. They don't fully trust God. There will always be people who will justify, excuse, approve, even encourage, encourage you to do the wrong thing. In the church, that will happen. You can always find a pastor who will say, that's okay, go ahead, you're doing the right thing. Part of spiritual maturity and spiritual wisdom is knowing who to listen to and who not to listen to. There may be people in your life who are like Abishai. They're important to you. They're family members. They're connected to you. They, they've done some good things in your life, but they're not people you can trust when it comes to following biblical counsel. And a good sign of spiritual wisdom is knowing who to listen to and who not to listen to. Actually, this story goes so well in juxtaposing, or I don't know if I'm saying that word right, but con showing two different angles because David, previously, only a few verses earlier, Abigail came to him, and what did he do to, with her? He listened. He said, you are a woman of discernment. He recognized this is God's voice. God's using her to speak to me when everybody else was telling him the wrong thing. But now he knows Abishai, he's not the man to listen to. I'm not going to listen to him. Sometimes you have to reject unbiblical advice. And I say that, I don't want to spend too much time here, but I have been in prayer meetings. I've been in Sunday school. I've been in just our gatherings here on Sunday mornings when people are fellowshipping where I have listened to Christians tell other Christians bad biblical advice or unbiblical advice. Well, you need to put your husband in his place or you need to tell him either you're going to go to church or you're going to divorce him. I've actually had Christians tell other Christians that. That is not the people you should be listening to. They may be great people in some respects, but they're not the people to listen to. Be careful who you listen to. Let's not forget, we're in this mess that we're in the world today because somebody listened to the wrong person. Amen? you got to choose your counsel wisely. So your spiritual journey is going in the right direction when you're ignoring people who are giving you unwise, unbiblical advice. Sign number four. Your spiritual journey is going in the right direction when you're patiently waiting on God to act in His timing. This is a biggie, I think. One of the real indicators that you're really making headway spiritually is that you have the ability to do nothing and wait for God to do something. And that sometimes is the hardest thing to do. Do you understand where I'm coming from? Because when we're in a scenario where there's pressure, we're like, I've got the pressure. What do we feel? I've got to do something. And sometimes what the greatest thing of faith that God wants you to do is just wait. Do nothing. And as I thought about this, I thought of, uh, you know, you ever watch the, a knife thrower? a professional knife thrower, and almost always they have this like scantily clad woman. What does she, what does she have to do? She has to stand there 
usually like this, why a guy throws knives at her. What is her only job? Don't move. Do nothing. But you know what? Every part of you, every fiber of your being, whenever you see a knife coming at you, wants to do what? Do something. Move. Do something. Because you feel you have to. It's just protecting yourself. It's common sense. But trust enables that person. Usually it's the person's wife. So they must really trust their husband. You, and they, they have trust them enough to not move, even in the most precarious of situations. And really, that is a good example of what God sometimes calls us to do. Just stand still, do nothing, wait on me. Well, David has that faith and that willingness to wait on God. He even expresses it in verse 10 to 11, where it says this. It says, And David said, As the Lord lives, the Lord will strike him, or his day will come to die, or he will go down into battle and perish, but the Lord forbid that I should put out my hand against the Lord's anointed. But take now the spear that is at his head and the jar of water and let us go. Now the reason he took the jug and the spear is because that's like the selfie of the day. He couldn't prove he had been there any other way. He's not stealing it. He's going to return it. But he's going to prove that he could have hurt Saul to try to get Saul's attention. But what I want you to notice is he says, basically David says, I have no clue how this is going to end. We like to think of these men in the Bible and these women of the Bible knowing exactly what God's plans were and somehow we think we're supposed to know too. But the truth is, most of the time they had no clue what God was doing and most of the time we have no clue what God is doing. Can we agree on that? We're completely like in the dark. David says, well, something's going to happen. <laughs> he may die of old age. He may die in battle. Uh, 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 you know, but the Lord's going to take care of it. I'm not going to deal with it. I'm just going to wait on God. And that's a pattern you see throughout Scripture. That's where God, Remember when God took the Israelites out of Egypt and they barely began their journey? He brings them to the Red Sea. They, they're, they're kind of stuck there. And then the army, the Egyptian army, comes after them with, with their chariots. And Moses, and Moses prays. And what does God st say? Stand still. He doesn't say fight. He doesn't say run. He doesn't say strategize. He just says, stand still and see the salvation of your Lord. Same thing with Jehoshaphat's army. You know the story. You may not have read it in a while, but remember, Jeho they're all like, what are we going to do? We're going to be killed by this army. And God says, you won't have to fight this battle. And Jehoshaphat says, okay, that's what the Lord says. And he puts his singers up front. What kind of military strategy is that? You know, I mean, we know singers. They're always the weakest, most sissified people. I'm sorry, no. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> No, but that's what he does because he has to trust God's going to take care of it. And I'm not saying God always has us doing nothing. Sometimes he guides us to do something, but probably most of the time he's working out his plan in our life and he's just saying, just let me take care of it. Just trust me. I have a plan and I'm not choosing to tell you what my plan is. That's a sign of spiritual growth and going in the right direction where we can say, you know what? God will take care care of it. I'm just going to wait on God to act, wait on God to provide, wait on God to rescue, whatever the situation may be. David says he doesn't know how or when God's going to take care of it. David doesn't even know why he's going through this trial. I won't spend a lot of time there for the sake of time, but in verse 19 he says, I don't know what's behind this. If I've offended God and God has sent me after, you, you know, if, if God's angry at me, then let him accept the sacrifice. He figures maybe I've done something wrong. But if other people are stirring this up and they're kind of causing problems, then let God judge them. But he doesn't really know that the heart of the issue is, is, Saul, is Saul's heart. He's jealous. He's prideful. He doesn't know that. He doesn't know what's going on, what the outcome will be, or when it will be resolved. He simply has to wait. And that's where God puts so many of his people. We forget that. This is something the Lord really laid on my heart, so I want to spend just a minute here. We forget that the characters of the Bible story don't have, did not have all the information that we have. Job did not know Job chapter 1. Do we understand that? We, have, we get to see the insight. There's this thing going on in heaven, and Satan is, is challenging God, and we see all this. Job doesn't know that. Job just knows that everything's falling apart in his life. Job doesn't know the end of the story. He just happily has to wait on God. Joseph, we all love the story of Joseph, his many-colored you know, coat, and you know, how he was cast into a well, and he was sold into slavery, he was falsely accused, he was thrown into prison, then he was raised up to the right hand of Pharaoh. At, 
And the thing is, Joseph had no clue what God was doing until after the fact. And this was 20, over 20 years later when he finally says, what, God, what you intended for evil, God intended for good. That wasn't during it, that was after it. That's the same way with us. That's the same way with David. He doesn't know what's going on, why it's happening, or how it will all work out, but he has to trust God to take care of it. He has to just wait. And sometimes people are saying, what is God's will? I want to know God's will. And most of the time I think God's will is just keep trusting me and do whatever's next before you. I'll take care of the rest. Amen? So sign number four you're, is your spiritual journey is going in the right direction when you're patiently trusting on God to act in his timing. And then sign number five is your spiritual journey is going in the right direction when you're confident God will reward right choices. After David does this and shows that he could have killed Saul with the spear, with the spear and the sword, Saul comes out with the same old phony emotional repentance. Oh, David, I'm so sorry. Not going to happen again. I will quit pursuing you. By the way, in the next chapter, what is Saul doing? Pursuing David. So that's a complete lie. Just an emotional moment. He didn't mean it. So David wasn't rewarded by Saul really repenting and things and they're all hugging each other and everybody goes home. That wasn't the reward, but he did believe God would reward him. And that is a sign of spiritual maturity, that you believe that doing the right thing will be rewarded. Look at verse 23. Look what David said. The Lord rewards every man for his righteousness and his faithfulness. For the Lord gave you into my hand today, and I would not put out my hand against the Lord's anointed. Behold, as your life was precious this day in my sight, so may my life be precious in the sight of the Lord, and may he deliver me out of all tribulation. David believes that doing the right thing is a good thing that will be rewarded. And one of the places we, we know we're in trouble spiritually, just look at the opposite side, is whenever we think, you know what? It doesn't do any good to do good. It doesn't do any good to do good. You just get the short end of the shaft. Psalm 73 is a psalm that is kind of one of my favorites. I don't know if I ever like to say I have any favorite scripture, but it's one that comes to mind a lot for me. And I think part of the reason is, is and I'm doing this from memory, so forgive me if I get it a little bit wrong, but at the beginning of the psalm, verse 1, it says, Surely God is good to Israel, but as for me, my father, foot had almost slipped and he goes on for like 10 verses to talk about how he looked at the arrogant the wicked the prideful and how they just were getting rewarded and nothing better happened to them and he was doing the right thing and nothing but bad stuff happened to him he's saying my foot almost slipped and thinking it does no good to do good that's a bad spiritual place to be a good spiritual place to be one that shows you that you're thinking right and, and on the right path spiritually is when you can say to, like david the Lord rewards every man for his righteousness and his faithfulness. When you make good decisions, a hundred, I actually believe this, 100% of the time when you do the right thing, there's a blessing involved. That no, at no time does God overlook. In fact, Jesus said, you don't even give out a cup of cold water in my name without that being rewarded. The smallest right choice God honors. That's spiritually healthy thinking it's not always evident in the short term i can't always say well i did this and two hours later this happened or two days later this happened but it's faithful to the scripture and it's necessary the bible tells us in hebrews 11 verse 6 you know this we usually remember the first part not the second part and without faith it is impossible to please him or to please god for whoever would draw near to god must believe that he exists and this is important and that he rewards those who seek him. It's not enough to believe that God is this, but you must believe he's a good God who does watch over the earth, who does reward right behavior. That's the example of God-pleasing faith. That's what David had here. He believes that this decision not to harm Saul will work out in his benefit. And truly it will ultimately work out in his benefit. So now we've looked at chapter 26. And don't you wish that all of life was like chapter 26? That we're just, we're on this like spiritual journey that's always upward? But what's your spiritual journey like? I know what mine's like. It's up, down, up, down. Is yours like that too? Amen? Well, so was David's. Take a little bit of solace in that because the next chapter, which is about two years later, 
about two years later, about eight years now that Saul's been pursuing David, is an example of all the signs of not going in the right direction. So let's go ahead. I want to, again, this is a much shorter chapter, but I want to read it, the entirety, and then we'll come back and look at some signs that we're going in the wrong direction. Verse, chapter 27, verse 1. Then David said in his heart, Now I should perish one day by the hand of Saul. There is nothing better for me than that I should escape to the land of the Philistines. Then Saul will despair of seeking me any longer within the borders of Israel, and I shall escape out of his hand. So David arose and went over, he and the six hundred men who were with him, to Achish, the son of Maok, the king of Gath. And David lived with Achish at Gath, he and his men, every man and his, ho- every man and his household, and David with his two wives, Ahinoam of Jezreel and Abigail of Carmel, Nabal's widow, And when it was told Saul that David had fled to Gath, he no longer sought him. Then David said to Achish, If I have found favor in your eyes, let a place be given me in one of the country towns that I may dwell there. For why should your servant dwell in the royal city with you? So that day Achish gave him Ziklag, and therefore Ziklag has belonged to the kings of Judah to this day. And the number of days that David lived in the country of the Philistines was a year and four months. Now David and his men went up and made raids against the Gersherites and the Gersites and the Malachites, for these were the inhabitants of the land from of old, as far as sure to the land of Egypt. And David would strike the land and would leave neither man nor woman alive, but he would take away the sheep, the oxen, the donkeys, the camels, and the garments, and come back to Achish. And when Achish asked, Where have you made a raid today? David would say, Against the Nagab of Judah, or against the Nagab of the Jeharmalites, or against the Nagab of the Kenites. That's territory in Israel. And then in verse 11 says, And David would leave neither man nor woman alive to bring news to Gath, thinking, lest they should tell about us and say, So David has done. Such was his custom all the while he lived in the country of the Philistines. And Achish trusted David, thinking, He has made himself an utter stench to his people Israel. Therefore he shall always be my servant. So here we are two years later, later, and these chapters are put together so that we can compare them, the ups and the downs. Sometimes we're in chapter 26, and sometimes we're in chapter 27. And I don't want you to think that, sometimes when we're reading the Bible, I think it's easy to forget the timetables because you read one verse, and the very next verse, verse says, then David said. But it means two years later, this came into David's heart. I want to share with you three signs from this chapter, three signs that your spiritual journey is going in the wrong direction. Because this is David's down chapter. Here's sign number one. Your spiritual journey is going in the wrong direction when the thinking of your heart or the words out of your mouth express doubt and defeat. So whether the words are literally coming out of your mouth or they're only kept up here contained within your mind and your heart, we all say stuff. Do you know what I'm saying? Even when we don't say stuff out loud, aren't we always talking to ourselves and saying things and thinking things? And that reveals a lot about us, where we are spiritually. We're told in verse 1 that David said in his heart. doesn't mean he said it out loud, but it was in his heart. And it made a difference. Here's what, you know, he said, he says, completely, utterly different than what he just said in chapter 26. Now he says, I shall perish. He just got through saying, the Lord shall reward me and protect me. Now he says, nothing better for me. My only option, God's no longer to defend me. My only option is to escape to the land of the Philistines. I have no choice. Before he had said, the Lord will deliver me. Now David's saying in his heart, I have to deliver myself. God, if, if, if the saying had been around in David's day, he would have said, God helps those who help themselves. David's words or the thinking of his heart is a revelation of where he's at spiritually. Listen to yourself. What do you think about? What do you say in your mind? What do you say out loud? Because it reveals the true state of your faith. Now I have to clarify here because there's a big erroneous teaching out there that's common in the church today, often referred to as name it and claim it. I call it blab it and grab it. And for those who don't know what it is, basically the idea is that whatever you say is what comes true. You cause things to happen. So if you say, I'm going to get a a, a $20 an hour raise at work, 
you'll cause it. Or if you say, I feel like I'm getting a cold, you cause it. The Bible doesn't actually teach that. But what the Bible does teach is that your words reveal the condition of your heart. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. What you're thinking in your heart, what you're saying out loud, reveals whether you're on a spiritually progressive path or spiritually downward path. And we all go through both. Well, David's words here are negative. They're, wor they're words of defeat and discouragement. Can we agree on that? They're words of, this is never going to work. I'm going to die here. I have no hope. I've got to go to the land of the Philistines. I have to deliver myself. That's not words of faith. And when we're saying similar kinds of things like, well, this will never work out, I have no options, I'm in trouble here, it's hopeless, I will never be free of this habit or this sin, I've got to do something, I'm going to go bankrupt, I'm going to die, I'm going to lose my job. When we're talking like that, it's a revelation to us. And it reveals to us that our real problem is not our problems. Now let me clarify what I mean by that. We often think that our problem is whatever's going into our life going on in our life, a financial crisis, a relationship crisis, a health crisis, um, a work crisis, whatever it may be. And those are problems. But the real problem that our words reveal is whether you trust God in the crisis. And our words reveal that. Now, I'm not saying this to be condemning, because the truth is all of us go through those down times. All of us, myself included. This is not meant to be, how dare you? put more burdens on you now. The, it's just meant to say, hey, you know, the real issue here is not your problem, but your faith. Are you trusting God, or are you doing like David's doing, and think, I got to figure this out on my own. I got to, I got to have a solution. I got to figure it out. That's what David is doing. Your spiritual journey is going in the wrong direction when the thinking of your heart or the words out of your mouth express doubt and defeat. Sign number two. Your spiritual journey is going in the wrong dire direction when you're making decisions that are motivated by fear rather than by prayer and faith. Big changes in this chapter compared to previous five or six chapters of David's life. Think about it. In verses 2 through 7, here's what we learn. He left the territory of Israel. He lived with the Philistines. He depended on a pagan king for provision and for support. Why did he do this? Did he pray about this? Did a prophet come to him and say, do this? Did the word of the Lord come to him? Did a promise of God lead him to Philistine territory? In fact, the last word that David received from David, David received from David, David received from God, and you may have to go back a few chapters, it was from the prophet Gad, who told him, leave the stronghold and go down to Judah and stay there. That's the last word that God gave to David. So David's decisions, all of these decisions are based not on prayer, not on a word from God, not on the promise of God, but they're based on fear. The pressure to do something. And fear, I just tell people all the time, any decision made in fear is almost always the wrong decision. Almost always, almost 100% of the time. The thing is, had God shown himself able to protect David while he was in Israel? Now I want you to think about this. It caught my attention that we're given a timetable for how long that David was in the Philistine territory. We're told in verse 7 that he was there for 16 months, one year, four months. Here's what's important about that. Right after this one year and four months, David will, Saul will be killed and David will ascend to the kingship. David had just spent eight and a half years on the run, and God had protected him through it all, but he failed in the last year and a half. He only had about 13% of the journey left. But fear led him to make a bad, bad decision. Now, this decision David makes, I'm not going to have time tonight. I'm sure Pastor Josh will cover it in coming weeks. But in the next few chapters, this one decision almost ruins everything for David. His family gets kidnapped. His property gets stolen. He almost goes to war against his own people and almost forfeits his kingship all because of this one decision. God mercifully rescues him from this bad decision, but only by mercy. It was still a bad decision because it was acting in fear. 
And I want you to just look at your own life and say, if you're acting in fear, if you're doing this, I got to do this because I have no choice. I'm afraid if I don't do this, this is what will happen. That's not a good way for Christians to make decisions. We make decisions based on prayer, faith, God's guidance, seeking wisdom from others, but never say this idea, oh, I got to do something or I'm in trouble here. Trust God or you're going to find yourself regretting those decisions as David did. Then finally, sign number three. Your spiritual journey is going in the wrong direction when you're compromising on complete moral obedience because it seems necessary. We see a big shift here in David. I don't know if you called it, so I'm going to share it with you. But David was a man of of significant moral sensitivity. He was committed to God's ways. He was so sensitive, as you may recall from last week, that when he made one small thing, he cut off the corner of Saul's robe He was cut to the heart and broken over it. This is the man who refused to steal Nabal's sheep. Remember when he was out in the wilderness and they really needed him? He said, no, we guarded him, we protected him. He was a man who would not do the wrong thing most of the time. But here we see him going backwards because in verses 8 through 12, here's what we find out. David lied to Achish repeatedly. David stole the property of other people as he raided them and he murdered everyone in the town. Now I, thought, I think about this. There were times where God ordained for people to go to a holy war and to destroy towns. That's not what's going on here. This is not done in the name of God. This is David protecting himself. Can you imagine that? The same David who, who is now willing to kill people just to, keep, to cover up, who would not even, who was brokenhearted over cutting up a cut arm corner of Saul's robe who refused in the previous chapter to kill him is now willing to kill whole towns but that's what happens when you go in the wrong way spiritually and if you and I find ourselves doing things that previously we would not have done saying things engaging in relationship watching things on television acting in ways that previously we knew were wrong but now we're finding a way to justify It isn't like the moral standards of God has changed. Your spiritual discernment has changed. You're now approving of what you once would have disapproved and were probably wiser when you disapproved of it. So look at your life. Don't just justify it. Look at it and say, am I really in a good spot right now? And the whole purpose of all of this is to get us to examine ourselves. And if we're like David and a lot of what we see is in chapter 27 here, then we can make a turnaround by God's grace. If we see that, hey, things are going really good, I'm walking in faith, I'm obeying God, I'm trusting God, praise God, keep going in that direction. Amen? Let's pray together. Father, I thank you that you are with us no matter what chapter of our spiritual life we're in. And we all acknowledge here, sometimes it feels, Lord, and maybe it seems to us that we're more often in uh, a, a downward trend than an upward trend. But we know that you're with us through it all. But we pray that by your grace, we would recognize though any area in which we're failing and we would turn to you in repentance and in commitment to you and Lord wherever we may be uh, prospering because of your strength that we would rejoice in that because it's only by your hand that we make any forward progress at all but you are working in us and through us for that we are grateful I pray your blessing on each of those who came out tonight watch over them keep them and bless them I pray in Jesus name amen let's stand and worship the Lord